good hello morning or good evening wherever, wherever you are i'm here sitting with hans i'm sitting here with hans and we are, we have also henrik in stockholm today we will speak about the the same broadcast that we addressed yesterday and in this broadcast that we addressed um we discussed the thing about superposition, namely if the observer can influence the result. So, for instance, in the total experiment in SCAT, is can the person who observes, let us say, a cat in a metal box, if the cat has a uh, if the cat is in a the cat is in a undecided position between being living or dead, can the observer when he or she opens the box decide, so to say, if the cat uh, lives or is dead? So can consciousness, that is the observer, influence the outcome of the person or the human, uh, the, uh, the animal who is inside a box? So can observer um, influence material things? So the video that we discussed yesterday, the presenter there, he said, no, according to this presenter, the scientists, the majority of scientists say that the observer cannot influence the outcome of uh, material things. Uh, there is no, that is, there is a objective reality. So if you have a cat in a box, and the observer has no, cannot in any way influence if the cat is living or dead. So there is an objective reality. So, so we have discussed two terms, the Latin, two, two Latin terms, ex anteriori or ex posteriori. The ex anteriori means before, and ex posteriori means after. So in this, um, so what people or the scientists, majority of scientists do, do today. So they mix two concepts, that is ex anteriori, that is before. So uh, if you, let us say that you, Henrik, open uh, a box and there you have a dead cat. You see that the cat is dead. Bad for the cat, but the cat is dead. Uh, so the scientists say, no. Nah, uh, it's obvious the real the cat died. You didn't influence uh, the cats uh, being, being 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 dead. You didn't have. But the scientists mix. Um, they don't take in consideration time. Of course, if you go to a place and you see a dead cat, um, you can say that you didn't have any any influence on the cat. But they didn't take in consideration time. It's easy afterwards to say that the cat was uh, dead all the time. But you didn't know. So from quantum physical standpoint, time is everything. So you have to take in consideration time. So when you go to a place and you see a dead cat, you actually, the observer did decide that the cat was dead. Uh, you could also have decided that the cat was living, so the cat was living. But you have to take in consideration time, because in quantum physics, time is everything. Um, so that is ex anteriori, that is beforehand. You, when you go to a place, you see a dead cat, so the cat is dead. So you did decide that the cat was dead. While when the scientists say that you didn't observe uh, you, that you your your watching the cat you didn't have anything to do with the cat. They are not actually. They are working in classical physics. They have completely forgotten the influence of time, uh, the observation. So the observation takes place. The so you cannot say that the cat would be dead. Um, without, so to say, the influence of the observer. When you see the cat, it's, and that, that, that is the moment, the scientific moment. 
So scientific speaking, the cat is dead or alive when you observe it. Afterwards, it's easy to say, yes, the cat was uh, uh, living. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, that, that is, there is an obvious reality, but that, that is not science. That is not a science. That is science that was, that we have, uh, so to say, left already 90 years ago. That is all science. So to say that the, dead, uh, that the cat was living or dead, all, uh, independent of the observer, that is all science. They, take in they don't take in consideration the time of the observation. The time of the observation is the key term to understand class, uh, yes. quantum physics. Time of the observation, that is before or after. So uh, when you, you have to take into consideration time and the observer, the time of the observation. Uh, Henrik, would you agree or Hans? Yeah, it's a very good point there. Uh, what we have to remember, even though it's uh, pinpointing to a quantum physical problem, uh, the superposition and how it collapses, we must remember that uh, all the ingredients in the thought experiment, for instance, with the cat, but also the double slick experiment, are uh, almost completely classical. They are made in a classical way. And we have uh, isolated something, which we're not allowed to in quantum physics, really. So we're making a, a sort of compromise between quantum physics and classical physics. And that needs to be remembered that classical physics is the instrumental part here. A double slit experiment is classical showing quantum physical <laughs> phenomena. That's very important. But, but in a way, you could almost claim that the double slit experiment is unscientific. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because mm. it doesn't take in consideration the observer, which is everything. Yeah, 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 you could say that. And uh, another uh, interesting thing here is uh, uh, you have to take in consideration who set up the experiment from the beginning. Usually uh, there's a loads of experiments that are completely classical and the result will be predictably, and you can almost say that it was determined from the beginning. But who set up the experiment from the beginning was the observer made by consciousness. That's also an important part to take into consideration. How do you set up the things that is done by consciousness? So I, as I mentioned in, in the former podcast, we always try to sort of uh, uh, by magic make the subject disappear, the observer. This is how we actually construct experiments. So the observer doesn't seem to play a role, but it does play a role. Who's setting up the experiment? It's the observer. Who decided that? That was the intention. That's the intention that tells us if we see a wave or particle. So that's the intention from the beginning. And uh, there's also this confounding, as Kalle said, the time here. What comes before and what comes after? And if we already set up what we wanted to have, we already made preparations to get a result that's definite. We decide that. If we make classical experiments from the beginning, we set it up so that the result will be definite. It's going to look like it's already decided. So it's very, very hard to, and I think it's never going to happen that there's not, not going to be a different view. This is the ambigram talking. There's always going to be, a, I would even say, there's going to be a majority who's going to think that it's always decided. The majority of scientists are always going to be that because that's unchangeable. Because in the end, it's an ambigram. But if you want to be really, really careful and really specific, you can see that actually somewhere is lurking behind in the jungle. <laughs> there you have the observer. 
but he hides. And it's this hide and seek that's been going on. Uh, the whole development of Western metaphysics, we all will find a new way of trawling away uh, the subject, the observer, and we always manage to do it, but it turns up somewhere. In, for instance, in Gödel, it turns up in the end, and it's a surprise. Wow, you can't bo both have completeness and consistency. You have to choose. That is the observer being there somewhere in the background. He set up the experiment, he set up the thinking, and he's partaking in the whole thing, he's decisive. <laughs> And then he looks at what he, he himself done and said, this was always decided. He looks what he'd done and he says, this was always decided. Self-confirmation in, in a way, you could say, but made to look in the most elegant, most complicated way to be that you actually discover something you didn't know before. But uh, it's put into the whole experiment, the whole thinking thing, that it was decided from the beginning. So we could so complicate. We, we have uh, Bell's theory, right? Uh, yeah. Superposition, mm -hmm. uh, where he um, proves that the superposition really is that the both is the cat is both alive and dead at the same time, right? That was the outcome okay. of Bell's uh, theorem. Yeah, yeah. I what, what it. it is really not decided beforehand, uh, so to speak, ex anteriori. Yeah, what the cat, what the cat is both really alive and dead at the same time. That was Bell's theory. Yeah, so yeah. Okay? yeah it, so uh, what would, then we have a collapse of the superposition mm -hmm. by the observer, by by a measurement, rather. By a measurement, we collapse the superposition, and then. It shows uh, ex posteriore, ex posteriore, that the cat is alive, right? Uh, so then we uh, have both uh, alive and dead cat in the superposition, and we have a measurement, and we have a, a ex posteriore. I think what the PBS uh, channel uh, objects about is that I can decide that I want the cat to be alive. And I can somehow influence the cat to be alive. It doesn't matter. Uh, of course, there is a measurement and an observer that ob observes the result of the experiment. But can I decide that the cat should be alive? And I really want it to be alive. And therefore, I create the cat to be alive. X posterior. Yeah, we have to back there. We have to back all the way back to Bell and start there. Yes. We have to see what he discovered. Uh, that's the important point. And uh, when Bell started to, to, to check this out, he had no idea that he would find a method of deciding that reality is undecidable. He had no idea of that. That came as a complete surprise to Bell himself. Method. Yes. The cat is and both moment, alive and dead. It is at the exact moment of the measurement. You have to wait with the cat for a while there. Uh, we, we have to stop with Bell here. And he didn't know he's going to find a tool to prove that reality is undecided. But he went a really, really weird way. He came up with something that was completely unexpected even to himself. By using these two, and I don't think even when he discovered the tool to go about, it's very similar to Gödel. Gödel, when he started uh, the mission that was made by Hilbert, he had no idea it would go so quick. He actually did think this is going to take decades, as Hilbert said, decades of calculation. It would take maybe until we get a computer force 
that will be strong enough to do the calculations. But Gurdon, he found a completely different model out of the blue. He had no idea that model would come. It's similar with Bell. What he discovered, this tool of helping him to prove either that the world is decided or that the world is completely undecided from the outset. That was a complete surprise to Bell himself. And I have to pinpoint here, it was not a result he wanted himself. Actually, it put him into a depression and he took his life earlier on. Some people are uh, speculating him. Yes, yes, he was more on the Einstein side or so to speak. So yeah. God doesn't play dice and stuff. So there we have the undecidability. And when we see an experiment like uh, the presenter puts out, or we think about Schrodinger's cat, we must try to find that undecidability. We must, we must uncover the observer. We must uncover who is doing, who's the subjective, who's the observer, where does the observance come from that decides the superposition. We must actively look for that. We cannot. Uh, so to be presented with an experiment and start to think then, we need to actively, before we start the experiment, know that there is a subjective partaking somewhere. We need to know that beforehand. Then we have a chance of finding it, and then we can ex posteriori show it to the presenter or something, but we need to do the same process with every experiment. Maybe in the end, we will give up and say that John Bell had a point, I'm not going to argue anymore, or you will continue as the presenter of PBS did. But I think I'm pretty sure this will continue forever. This will continue. The majority will always say, even though what John Bell proved or what Gurdon proved, that everything was decided from the beginning. And that lies in the nature how we are built to function lies in human perception. And that's a massive problem. That is, is not going to change ever. But the good thing is that we know there is a subjective partaking. Good will prove that as well. We cannot take away the observer, no matter how we construct the experiment. It can hide. You can actually construct something to be looking that there is no subjective partaking here. There is no observer. And uh, the same actually had happened to Niels Bohr. Uh, I mentioned that earlier uh, in the conference in Solvay, one of the more deciding conferences, uh, Einstein proposed something in the conference and it was quite convincing for everyone. One could say there is no uh, meddling with the fist. Uh, there's no uh, messing up the results. There's no partaking of the observer. We can do measurement without affecting. You get my drift? Yes, but you still haven't asked my, answered my question. Is it possible then for the observer to choose that the cat should be alive rather than dead? And it's the observation that chooses, one could say. It's not uh, the yes, will. And that this observation uh, is independent, has got in, nothing to do with the observer. It's, it's, that's a tricky philosophical question. But it's the observation that makes it. Uh, it's the same as you look at an ambigram. Uh, is it like this? That uh, the ambigram can sort of change between two perceptions, even if there is a computer looking at the ambigram? Well, I don't think so, but that's my perspective. But there is always an observer deciding in the end, and it's the observation that decides. And the observation is neutral and, and independent, and uh, it's either a dead or alive cat. Yeah. But we must remember uh, this experiment was so complicated and so refined 
when it was presented by Einstein that Bohr completely gave up. And he's the genius behind that there actually are a superposition from the beginning before John Bell. But he, he gathered force. He, he took his, all his doctorates together and he came with a contra-argument the day after. And after that, Einstein didn't say anything. And we will always be presented with experiments. They're going to come new experiments. Johan, or, uh, he sends me every, day, every third or fourth month, uh, that's the journalist, uh, something he found on the web, on the internet. A new experiment or a new thought experiment that proves that the observer is not partaking, uh, has nothing to do with the result. Mm -hmm. So that will always happen. It's not, it's not going to end. This is not going to be definite because it lies in the matter. It cannot be definite because it's a sort of ambigram. What you choose is, is what's resulting that you have a causality or what you're choosing will decide that you don't have a causality. So do you see the complexion here? Yes. But, but uh, let, let's suppose uh, that Henrik and I, we are walking in Stockholm and we see a cat and we see the cat at the same moment. So, so whose observation is it which decides if the cat is <laughs> dead or living? If it's dead, uh, maybe we will weep, uh, weep a little, but uh, whose observation is that which decides? If you if see the cat at the same moment, if Henrik and I, we see the cat at the same moment, so how, how is it, it complicates the thing? No, it's, the, it's an observer that makes uh, the superposition to collapse. And so uh, our observation at the same moment, that is, it's, a, it's a mutual, it's a chat observation that makes it collapse by four eyes. Well, it's, it's, it doesn't really matter. It's always an observation that makes it collapse. Okay. There is always an observation that makes it collapse. <clears throat> but you can't really say whose. It's, uh, it's a very difficult question because it, it, it doesn't, uh, quantum physics doesn't deal with uh, uh, things like psychology or it doesn't um, uh, regard problems of different minds and those things. What he concludes is the observation is what makes the superposition collapse. That's what but, he says. But, but is there something I can do with, uh, I don't know, yoga and mindfulness and meditation and stuff to, to really create the superposition to collapse in my way, the way I want it? Yeah, yeah, I would, that's my opinion. And I would say actually, yes. Because we were talking about then, then this. I can then I can decide if I want the cat in the box to be alive or dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's my personal opinion, and this is not uh, supported by John Bell. But uh, look at it uh, at it this way. Uh, in because, the end, as Kalle said here, we do, you you first you say it doesn't matter if if you observe or I observe or Kalle observes. It doesn't matter. It's an observation independent. It at the same time, now you say that if I personally let, develop some let, kind of mindfulness. Let, let, let me answer the first question first, and, and that will take the second. The first question is, could I, this is my personal opinion. This is not supported by John Bell, or he doesn't go so far. They, uh, quantum physics doesn't, how can you say? It doesn't meddle with those things. It doesn't concern itself with those things. One could even say that quantum physics says that the observation is involuntarily non-controllable. I, yeah, I would say that, non-controllable. You cannot decide what you observe. It's a bit like the ambigram. It can be very hard to force yourself to see the other thing. But think of a much more, comp there are those ambigrams. I should show one of those ambigrams actually here, but there are ambigrams that is so difficult to see the other end. You have to, it doesn't help to force yourself. And if you see the other part of the amogram, it's incredibly difficult to go back to the first one. Those amograms exists. 
uh, I have a book. I actually brought that book with me. We can uh, look at it in, in the weekend. It's a bit telling. But my personal opinion, because it's in the end, we who decide the temporal order. Uh, and as I said in the previous lex lecture here we had in the morning, uh, 673, uh, the guy in the video, this uh, Dr. Dowds, I think he's an Australian from PBS, he is deciding, so to speak. He has an attitude, but that is so quick, he will never ever be able to reveal it, that there actually is some sort of attitude, a fixation of the temporal order, because how we are construction, how we are constructed uh, personally makes us habitually, automatically perceive the whole thing to be set up from the beginning as a direct perception. But my personal opinion is with yoga, with meditation, you can control that because it's something in yourself that decides the temporal order, sort of a fixation. But that does not usually happen. But I, I would open up for a possibility that could happen, actually. If I mean, then you have to be the first observer. I mean, if Kal and I was walking and he saw the cat first, then he's not meditating. And I saw the cat afterwards, and I am meditating. That I can't influence it anyway. Well, uh, I mean, if, if we have, yeah, it has if to be we're looking at the same cat. Yeah, it has to be the first one. And so the, other, it, the other, and time the other comes thing. in once again. That the first yeah, observation and, yeah, creates yeah. the super and, collapse to happen. And I have to pinpoint the other one who doesn't control it in this case. In my uh, idea here, he will never know the difference. He will never know the difference. He can't tell because he he has to be able to control himself somehow. And this is the same, this guy, this doctor, this PBS doctor, he will always, he will never ever quit saying it's inside from the beginning. And this is very important to understand, the majority of the scientists will not either. That will never change, it cannot change. Because it's in ourselves, it's our fixation, but it's been proven, it's not decided from the beginning. We know yeah, that for a fact. With well, for well, with well, it's not decided from the beginning. We cannot forget that, but we can try to get around it. But, but I think that there is actually a way to answer um, Henrik. So to say, uh, so there is a one thing is okay. If we leave the temporal uh, fixation, okay, we could, I think, we could uh, decide uh, uh, us three decide that agree that it's a temporal, it's a temporal question, okay. But the second question is that implied by Hendrik is that can I really influence, so to say, do I have the will to say that I want that cat life because I really love cats. Yeah. So that is another <laughs> question. That is another question. Um, and I think that we actually can say yes from science, namely because there are uh, experiments showing that, let us say that you speak to water. You speak lovely to water. You're, you're thinking of the Japanese scientist Emoto. Emoto, yes. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so if you speak to, let's say, lovely to, to flowers or to water, and they react positively, so it's a different quality of water. Uh, so, by if if you're a very loving person, <laughs> and if you think positively about a cat, can it, you decide, so to say, that the cat? It's a, it's a great possibility that the cat lives. Um, than let us say that you have plants or water. Uh, let's say plants is easier to imagine that because flowers do die. Uh, so if you cherish uh, your flowers, uh, speak kindly to them. So it's, it's a longer. It's a. It's a so this uh, this uh, Japanese scientists have shown that uh, they live longer. They they thrive if you speak longingly to them. So you can influence them. Um, then the question if. Uh, is if let us say that you're very uh, that you only you see the flowers with a loving um, loving um, attention 
if that can also influence, or is it on the speak, speaking? Oh, I, I, I think uh, we are drawing conclusions now, Henry, from Bell. Mm. Uh, and uh, that's actually legit, but uh, we have to, uh, it has the, this, the sense of speculation, mm. but it follows from Bell uh, that that would be the case, yes. And it's also interesting, this Emoto, he took some other people, uh, he started out with Japanese and he took some Americans. Mm. And the results were quite different. Some of those Americans said they love flowers and plants and they actually killed it off. <laughs> <laughs> But the thing is, we know we don't have a control. We do not have control over the observation. And I, I could be, it could be fair to say that some people have less control. If, if you have this temporal fixation, that is going to decide more than what you think you want to. We have the reflective consciousness that we spoke before. That is much more developed in the West than, in, than it is in the East. The East still has this, the pointing to the whole body. It's the body that makes the observer, observer, uh, observation. And that's uh, quite a lot different. The reflective consciousness wouldn't have anything to do with the collapse of the superposition. And if you confuse your consciousness with a reflective consciousness, uh, that will not have an effect. Reflective consciousness doesn't have an effect on the superposition. So he, he, the guy in the video, this PBS presenter, who's very good, by the way, I have to say, is very, very pedagogical. He obviously doesn't know that he's affecting the result. So he's being honest. He's not lying. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay. Shall we wrap it up or, I mean, um, we've taken a long journey here. I mean, ex anteriori, ex posteriori, bell, superposition. Um, and in the end, if we are capable of influencing the outcome of the collapse. So, yeah, yeah. A, lot to take, a lot to take in. Yeah, yeah, we covered uh, quite a lot. Uh, it's a funny thing. Uh, it's a whole other, as you say, Henry, uh, it's a whole other business uh, of speaking of your observation. They don't uh, philosophize about this. Uh, not Bell, not Schrödinger, not Heisenberg. What is this observation? Well, Schrödinger does to a certain part, very little, really. Uh, but this is something to think about. I think it's an important question to take up, and we should do another podcast about this just to investigate the area more thoroughly because that and, is and if it's uh, possible to prove it i mean <laughs> can it be proven well not in the way the pbs presented that 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 can never be proven it can it can be disproven that the observer is not partaking in the act that can be disproven that's what bell did uh, so we know that already for a fact let's look at the consequences Yeah, and also this uh, issue of who, who observes first. I mean, the person opens the box, sees the cat, and then another person comes in, the box is already open, so it has collapsed. So you have to be first on the observation then, if you want to influence your skills. You can say it much better to let the cat friend open the box. <laughs> but that cat maybe has a hidden desire that he doesn't know about, that it is actually in his body, that he doesn't like cats, even though he mm. has 10 cats at home. And the collapse will be that the cat is dead. I'm, <laughs> I'm barely, I'm, I'm just speculating now. But that is actually uh, something that Japanese Emoto was proving. Uh, he showed that depending who you are, do you have this reflective consciousness? Uh, that will uh, reflect or correspond to what you're saying, that you like plants or you like rice, you're a loving person, then you don't know if you're a loving person and uh, your uh, treatment of the plants will, will not be as nice as you think yourself. It was the stuff got to do with superposition. I mean, if, if we, you and I are talking and I get happier when we talk, 
uh, what has that got to do with superposition and the collapse of the observation? I mean, I, I might get happier if you talk to me and are lovable to me, but I mean, what? how do you connect that to superposition then? At, at you, and you, and you influence it in this way? I mean, it, it could be that they are sensitive. I mean, they're just sensitive to, mm -hmm. to know that you are lovable to, to me as a plant. Um, so I, I don't see the connection yet to, to the superposition specifically and the collapse of the super, uh, superposition. Yeah, no, it's uh, the subject today is extremely wide, extremely wide. It's, uh, it's very hard to make the ends connect, but I think we could call this a podcast where we just open up these ideas and we continue in the next podcast. Mm. Because it's extremely broad, as you say. Yeah. Yes. Uh, should we wrap it up, maybe, guys? What do you say? Yes. Good yes, talk. Exciting. And we thank you, Henrik. Thank you. Yeah, with listeners as well. Thank you very much. And let's continue next time. All right. Have a good day. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.